So welcome everybody to the Chan's Logic Podcast. Today I've got a special guest, Damien Lupo. You want to get, tell us a little bit about yourself, Damien? Yeah, Chandler. Uh, well, first off, thanks for having me here. I, it's it, it's always fun to have a conversation to to learn uh, you know about about somebody new and and I'm I'm learning about you and and I think you're you're going to learn some crazy things about me and, and my background and and bring some value to people that that they can use today and, and help them with their businesses and and things. Um, I I have had a lot of different businesses over the last 25 yeah 25 years. The first one at 11. And it was funny because it was an accident. It was like a lot of our businesses end up being, we're just, we're dealing with a problem or, or something that we were doing for fun. And it turns into this venture. And that for me, that was video games. I just had the, had a problem that I couldn't afford video games or really my parents couldn't afford them. And, and I said, well, this is a problem because I want to play. And so I ended up finding a way to go and buy biz, uh, video games in bulk and then sell them off one at a time. But in between those two events, I was able to play all the games I could ever want. So my personal problem, it's not like an epic world problem that, that I was solving, but I was, I was solving a problem. And it kind of planted the seed for the idea that as an entrepreneur, we have to continually think about the pain that we're solving, the pain that we're allevi- alleviating from somebody else. And if, if we are wondering what should we do, what business or what should we do to improve our business, the, the question is not really that, it's how do we find a deeper pain and how do we bridge it to the solution to relieve the pain from somebody? So that kind of evolved from video games into other things. And ultimately, it, it went into a, into real estate where I was solving the problem of home ownership. And for most people in, in the United States, it's a big issue. They, they really want to find a way into that. And, and I started doing my entrepreneurial thing. I was, I was finding a, a creative way to solve the problem for the person that couldn't get a bank to give them a loan. And I became the bank. And it, it was a it was a very, very profitable thing for a long time as I was being creative. It was profitable until I thought I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof and 150 houses in. I ended up with this total meltdown because it became all about the money and not about a deeper mission. And I'd, I'd love to really dive into that a bit, because if if we're not focusing on going out and doing something with our businesses that's based on more than just a bunch of money, then we're inevitably going to run into tough times or or speed bumps, and it's going to derail us. We've got to have something deeper that's more of a it's 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 more important than just a another check in the mail or or whatever. It's got to be something that matters to at, at a at an energetic level. Yeah, one hundred percent. I'm often talking about how in order to be live the entrepreneur lifestyle and to grow businesses and to be really involved in what you're doing, it has to be in your blood. Uh, you have to live, eat and breathe it. You have, it has to be what you're thinking about all the time. It's almost like your favorite activity to participate in. Yeah, it's, it's a healthy obsession. It's, it's what my friend Grant Cardone talks about in Be Obsessed or Be Average. I mean, if, we're, if we truly want to be a, a, a success, if we want to have a fulfilled life, a life worth living, we need to have some type of obsession. And to, to go through life, and think, okay, what does the average person do? And I hear that a lot with advice. The average person should do this. And I go, why would you ever want to be average? Be obsessed about something. Be so crazy about it that people are going, whoa, you're on fire. What is going on with you? They can't help but want to be engaged with you and support you and be on your train because most people's lives are so boring that and, and so just lukewarm that nothing's hot. And you run hot when you get obsessed, which is awesome. Yeah, that's huge. I find... If you want to be average, uh, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to sit at your day job and kind of do the the average thing for the rest of your life. But one thing I talk about a lot, too, is we can really kind of crush our strengths and find other people who can help us bring up our weaknesses. And so if you really pursue what you're strong at, it's going to be your passion and you're going to be able to kind of do the things that you need to do with that. What are your thoughts on that? <clears throat> yeah, and, and I, I love it. And it's it's a reinforcement that makes you feel alive and in flow. And it's almost effortless where you are in that space of focusing on the things that come naturally, there's always something with everybody that comes naturally. And you're right. Those things that don't come naturally are not the things that you should go out and spend all your time on because there's so many people that are great at those things, that love those things, that are just waiting for you to reach out and say, hey, join the team. And there's power and leverage in connecting with other people that are brilliant at their things. And then you get to be brilliant at yours. So for anybody that thinks they need to be stronger at their weaknesses, you've been misled. So I'm totally on the same page. Yeah, 100% agree. I, I find if if I try to do things I'm not very good at or that I'm weak at, it's going to take me several hours to figure out 
Whereas I could do what I'm good at, get it done quickly and find someone who does what I'm not good at and they get it done within a couple of minutes. And it's just an effective time management tool as well. Yeah. And, and what's what's amazing now and, and we you know, we're doing right now, we're using technology to share a message and connect and, and be able to communicate with potentially millions of people because we're all connected together on this thing called the Internet. And it's you've got all these freelancers that are that have their own unique thing that they do really well. And it's so simple to connect and have people supporting you and your mission without you having to stumble and be literally brain damaged the entire time with all these things that you don't know how to do and you're trying to figure out. I mean, I, I'm all for growth, but there's there's a point where you're literally just stuck in the mush and the weeds and and you're not really doing anything very well. And nobody really cares about that. It's it's what it's the people that do something exceptional. Those are the voices we pay attention to. It's the ones that pop out where they're really focused and, and they're just they're They are obsessed about something and they're shining bright. They're not just sort of a dull glow in the background because they're so average. It's you've got to be focused on that one thing. And that's where you pop. Agreed. It's that healthy obsession, the hundred, the drive. And it's just that thirst and hunger. And if you like to do it, and if you want to do it, you're going to it's all you're going to think about. And that's when you find the people who are exceptionally good at what they're doing, like you're saying. You were uh, talking a minute ago about uh, finding pains and helping people work, figure out what their pains are and working through that. Let's elaborate a little bit on pains and kind of how you would pull that out of people and figure and understand. Because I think a lot of people who pay attention to what I put out uh, don't necessarily understand how to find these pains in the consumer or whoever they're trying to sell their products to. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me because if we will sit down at a coffee shop or if, if we'll hang out with our friends or just random people and we just have random conversations, you'll start to hear what people whine and complain about, the things that they're struggling with, the things that are just not fun or or they're annoying. Those are the pain things. And it's it's even if you're just in your own work, if you talk to your customers and just kind of check with them, maybe you have five customers. It doesn't really matter. You just have to get in the conversation and then pay attention. What I think we tend to do is is we get in these conversations and we join people in their misery and we're not taking notes on what the misery is. So we can start to pull it away and, and solve that misery in their life. So really just paying attention and listening and using our ears instead of our mouth most of the time is going to just extract all of it. Because if you just sit there and, and shut up, you're going to learn all you need to know about where, where the pain is, where the misery is that you can solve. Uh, yo, exactly. So I have, you hit the nail on the head there. It's if you want to understand what your consumers need and what they're looking for, uh, listen to them. And if, even if you're not taking written notes, take mental notes, you're just, you always have to be in a state of listening. So you have to be paying attention. Oh, this person said this and other person said this, there's gotta be more people thinking this way. So now I need to really look into this and get obsessed with understanding this this and then I can make content around these ideas and help solve these pains. And that goes yeah, into, and, yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, I totally agree with you. And it's, it's, we have our own pains too. I mean, just think about how often we're frustrated by something. We're probably not the only one that's frustrated by that same thing. So if we just bump into things in the world, we're going to find pain points and they may have to do with our business or they may be at an entirely new business, but finding opportunities is a function of finding pain. Exactly. Uh, so the, this component of listening we're talking about goes into a couple other pillars. I always tell people that they need to actually uh, focus on and concentrate on because it's one of the things that ev almost everybody exclusively fails. And it's it's ex incredibly simple but incredibly hard to do. And it's the idea of actually executing on what you're saying you're going to do and not just talking and uh, putting out ideas. Ideas are great, but they're not so great if we don't execute on them. And then number two, being consistent with those ideas and actually following through with what you're doing. And then three, we talked about listening. So you can elaborate. Can you elaborate on the first two a little bit? Yeah, I, I can tell you that there's something that I, I know to be a, a fact, and that's with the venture capital that I've done over the years as the venture capitalist and raising money. And, and with, with all of the investing that I've done, when you look at the ideas and everybody thinks that their idea is worth a million dollars. The ideas are typically worth one to three percent of the value of something. So it's all about what you just said, the execution. Ideas are a dime a dozen. They're out there everywhere. And what's really valuable is the team that executes. So when, whenever I invest in a, in a company or, or a real estate deal or whenever I'm looking at something, I'm always looking at the team that's going to execute. I don't even care if it's a bad idea. I'd rather have a bad idea and a world-class <clears throat> team than a world-class idea and a, and a lukewarm team. That's how professional investors look at things. That's how businesses that are successful are run because they have an executing team. And they have an executing team because that team knows exactly what they're focused on. And it's one thing. 
just like Gary Keller talks about in his book, The One Thing. If you study that book, and that's one of the, the, the three or four books I study, you'll realize that there's this one thing that you can nail today and every day. And going into that one thing and delivering it, being, a, being accountable and being consistent will change everything because you'll become the go-to person and people will, will naturally attract to you because most people don't follow through. And, and so how do you do that? Like what, what's the shift if you're not following through, if you're not the go-to person? To me, the, the easiest bridge into becoming that person is to be accountable publicly and to somebody that's mentoring you that's going to make sure that you're, you're doing exactly what you say you're going to do. If you're left to your own devices, the likelihood is you're going you're gonna to be a squirrel like most of the population and just bounce around between ideas and not really deliver. So having the, the accountability is the, is the shift into world-class execution. That's huge. That, that's, uh, I think, an incredibly important piece is the, the fact that everybody needs some sort of mentor some person to hold them accountable or some way to be hold, held accountable to what they're doing because it tells them like, Hey, I need to do this, not just for myself, but I told someone else I'd be doing this. Then it puts you guys kind of on a pathway where you're consistently talking about what you're doing and you grow through the help of your mentor. Yeah. And, and I think uh, one of the mistakes that we often make or people make, and, and I, I haven't done this for a long time because I took this super seriously in the beginning of my career, but the idea that we have a, we have somebody that we can be accountable to because we have a friend or we have a, a spouse or something, it's not enough. In my mind, if you're not paying somebody, you're not paying attention. And when you do something public, like a year ago, just over a year ago, I decided I was going to do a daily video. I was going to do something I launched called the Leap Your Transformation. And part of this was because I wanted to get really comfortable with video. And so I went out there and told everybody on Facebook and everything, I'm going to deliver a daily video. And all of a sudden, I'm accountable to all these people in the ether, all these people that are now paying attention. And I didn't realize how many people were actually paying attention because if I was late with a video, I started getting emails. And all of a sudden, I had a whole bunch of accountability partners. So just stepping up and stepping out there really does change something because there's this shame factor that that kicks in and you don't want to look stupid. You don't want to, you want to be consistent. It's what Robert Cialdini talks about in his book, Influence, the consistency factor. Once we say something, we don't want to do something different because it, it knocks us out of integrity. And there's a, there's a piece of us that, that craves the integrity of being consistent. That's huge. So you said one thing there, the daily accountability, putting up videos on social media and a lot of that stuff. And I find that if you can start some sort of campaign where you have your your page associated with your personal brand or your business brand or whatever it's associated with, and you make that commitment to putting out one good piece of content a day, you start building that following and it forces you to be consistent. Because if you're not, you're going to start getting, like you said, emails from people and people are going to be quite commenting and saying, hey, where'd you go? Did you die? And then it, it puts that guilt factor right into it. Like, oh, I have to do this now. People are asking for it. <clears throat> But that, that's right. That you, you do. And, and, and you tend to step up. And, and so I think the, the fear that people have is, is they go, if I can, if I commit to something, if I commit to that daily thing, which is so powerful, I love that, that what you just said, there's this fear that you're going to not be able to deliver something good, that it's just going to be crap. Or I hear people sometimes going, well, I'm just going to record my videos. I'll come up with a, good, a bunch of good ideas and then I'll record them. And you're missing the whole point of the daily accountability. It's this, this ritual, this rhythm, the behavior and the muscle that you're developing. And what's, what I found to be most important was the commitment of every day I'm going to show up and I'm going to be raw. And we're missing this candid, raw communication and, and connection with other humans. And so if you can find a way to do that, your brand is going to explode because people are craving it desperately right now. Exactly. So I have the saying, be real, be human be social. And the, and you're saying exactly that by we're putting these things out and showing people that there's a human behind what we're doing. Uh, you're actually putting yourself out there and showcasing what you're doing and you're showcasing your humanity and you're being real with them by talking about kind of what you're doing, what you, they can do to solve their pains and really providing that piece that I think a lot of businesses and entrepreneurs are missing is the piece that we give incredible value to people before they purchase anything from us. So we create raving fans. And, and raving fans will follow you. They'll follow you into anything and everything and everywhere you go. 
you've got to create the people don't become raving fans because of necessarily a gizmo or a product. They become, they fall in love with the energy of, of who is behind the thing. I mean, that's, that's really how Apple developed. There was this, this fan base behind Steve jobs. It was his energy that developed so many of these things. And eventually the brand became its own energy even past Steve jobs, but there was something that started with his enthusiasm and his obsession. I mean, the guy was literally obsessed and in some minds a little crazy. And I just think that crazy is is a different version of obsession and people fall in love with that and they can't help but to be obsessed themselves with that energy. Yeah, a hundred percent. So you, you find that that's the way we, we uh, engage our business to be different. So it's, we're showcasing our humanity. You're becoming, you're people like Steve Jobs are showcasing this unique personality at the top of this chain that people wouldn't expect. They're expecting this monotonous corporate tone and everything. And then all of a sudden they have this guy who's doing all kinds of crazy things and talking all over the place. And if you do something similar in your own regard, you're essentially creating your own kind of cult-like following around your personal brand, which extends into your business brand as you do a lot of these things, or you can do the whole thing around your business brand. But the key piece is you're putting out content that showcases that you care that you're different and that maybe your business has a little bit of a personality behind it. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of the corporate world today. It, it's desperately missing. There's a, there's a, a playing to not lose mentality by so many companies that have been around a long time. And the problem is they're getting crushed by the, the cult like enthusiasm by startups. Mm -hmm. And that they're, this is one of the reasons that you see a lot of companies like Anheuser-Busch buying the microbreweries because there's a story, there's a cult like following and Anheuser-Busch cannot come up with that type of cult following. They just have the same people that are buying that beer. And what, what they are looking for is the people that are out there connected in a totally different way to the startups and the stories by the, the micro brews. Those are the things that that's what people are, are connecting with. They're, they're leaving these, these legacy brands and these companies. And so those, those companies are slowly dying and sometimes quickly, but it's happening and we've got to find a way to be more cult like and less stodgy and, and, and old school. Cause that stuff is just fading and it is dying and it's going to be blown away by the next person in the garage or the next person in their dorm room. Definitely. It's, I, I see this as we're transitioning from the old days when everybody would outsource all of their communications to somewhere that would frustrate customers. And now we're moving into where these smaller companies are so incredibly involved with building the relationship to the customer that we've moved into a, a customer centric business model where everything is based around engaging with them, talking with them, uh, creating relationships and content with them and just getting them to go back and forth and feel like they literally own a piece of your brand because they've been following it so long. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, it's funny to me. I was, uh, this whole idea behind Apple and Steve Jobs keeps coming up because to me, they're, they have figured out how to connect with people in so many different ways. Like when something goes wrong, you're almost more excited after the problem has happened and they've solved it. You've spoken with somebody like I'm here in Austin and sometimes I'll call their, their help, their Apple help, or Apple care. And I'll end up speaking with somebody that's literally in Austin or maybe they're in Phoenix or whatever. But it's I, I feel connected to them and they've made a conscious decision to invest in the people and the and the resources that make me feel more connected to their brand. And we can all do that in, in different ways. The, the question is, are we going to are we going to save a few dollars here and there to frustrate our customers and have them go somewhere else? Or are we going to invest in that long term relationship? And we have to be thinking bigger if we're thinking about the relationship, if we're thinking about how we're going to make a few bucks today. We're really transactional and really we're just going to starve to death slowly or fast. But we're going to eventually starve to death because those people will not stay with us. Those are not they're not going to become raving fans ever with that type of that, that engagement. Exactly. And I find that if you want these people to become raving fans, I was talking to an entrepreneurship class last night and I was telling them there's theory where we look at financial parameters and how we're going to save money and how we can do these things over, over time. And then there's practicality. So when you take the theory and try to move it into practicality, all of a sudden you have frustrated customers and no one in business school taught you how to deal with this or how to move financial par parameters around a frustrated customer who now hates your brand. It's like the idea behind people who uh, are extremely frustrated behind charter cable right now. They just, they outsourced everything and they can't fix their brand image because they didn't focus on the customer. <clears throat> yeah. And you've got to be, and you really truly have to be protective of that from the very beginning. And, and, and instead of, of ignoring the, the frustrated customer, you really want to engage with them because you're going to learn so much how to become a world-class brand by that person that has a bad experience. And I, I think a lot of companies absolutely miss that. They, they don't 
engage with their customer, they just get one and then they go to the next one and they're not really nurturing and they're not really learning because you can really learn what direction to go and, and how to fix problems you didn't even know you had if you'll just ask the questions and really show people that you care by showing up and being present with them. Definitely. And you said engaging the frustrated customer. I think that's huge. It's a lot of people think on social media and a lot of these places where we, the customers talk to our businesses directly that if you get someone who says something negative, you ignore them. But in my opinion, it's don't ignore them. Don't get upset with them. Ask them why they feel this way. Uh, talk to them on the thing in public and then ask them to private message you and see if you can really understand what that customer's specific pains are because pains aren't just associated with marketing to customers by listening to them, but it's associated with listening to them based off their negative emotions and switching your marketing efforts based off that as well. It, it is. And, and one of the things I've, I've, I've seen in my experience with, with engaging either with a customer or being the customer that's frustrated, there's two different things that happen. One, there's this ambivalence or, or two, there's this ownership where the, the there's a problem and, and the person that's frustrated goes out and, and they, most people are silent. When things happen, they just don't say anything and they disappear. The moment somebody stands up is this huge opportunity. And when we go into a space where we're asking for help or we're frustrated or we're telling this, this company, you suck, and that company says, well, actually, you're the one that made the mistake and they're blaming us as the customer, it, all that does is escalate things. And what's fascinating is as the, as the brand, as the brand ambassador, as the owner, whatever your role is, when you absolutely own it, you don't just – you know, appease somebody with, oh, I'm really sorry that you're feeling bad, but you say, this is totally my fault. I'm going to take care of this. I, I apologize. This is me. Even if it wasn't your fault, there's this feeling of, wow, okay, now I'm super impressed. Now I'm going to become a raving fan. I went from a raving lunatic, out of control, mad customer to a raving fan because you took ownership and wow, you know what? That's the kind of company I want to stay engaged with. That's the type of company and people that I'm going to share and spread the message about. So when we take ownership, and this is all about self-responsibility, you shift the entire energy of that frustrating customer from mad person to raving fan, like in a heartbeat. Exactly. And that's that comes down, down to that concept of being human. Customers want to interact with humanistic brands and brands with real people behind them. And if those real people start commenting, say, you know what? Uh, we, we messed up. We're, we did wrong. We're really sorry, but we want to get together and talk about how we can fix this. That's like you were saying, that knocks the customers back. Now they, they don't want to be mad anymore. They just want to get off the phone and tell everybody about how amazing their bad experience just was. <clears throat> Yeah, it's it, and, and this is this is you. This is the culture of caring. It's caring about the person more than just the transaction. More caring about their experience, even if you end up losing money. There, I've had people in, in one of my businesses that would they they change their mind or whatever. And I was selling precious metals, so they would they would order something and then they'd say, "I didn't like the year on the coin," and I go. Oh, okay. You know what? I am super sorry, and, and I'm absolutely going to send. I'm going to send you a label. I'm going to pay for your shipping. I'm going to give you a, a, just overboard. And it was that opportunity. I don't know if they ever show up again. But if you consistently treat people the way that they want to be treated, like you go beyond that, all of a sudden things start to pop up that you wouldn't expect from other people because somebody actually shares those type of experiences. And you have to be in that space all the time because you don't know which one's going to get shared. Some do, some don't. But if you are just half and half, some of your experiences are terrible and some are good, probably just you're just going to have the, the poor ones being shared and your brand is dead. So you've got to be totally consistent. And if you're starting a brand and you're building a culture, you've got to lead by example all the time. You cannot afford a misstep. You've got to be the cultural leader by engaging with people and taking care of people 100 percent of the time. Yeah, that's a great point. You find that a lot of people say that the customers with the bad experiences are the most vocal. But what they don't understand, what they've never actually probably tested and looked at is the customers with a cult-like following are even more vocal than the negative customers. And they will, if you have that, your thousand raving fans and someone says something negative, you don't, your, your company almost doesn't have to say anything anymore because those fans are going to be on there commenting and asking the person why. And, and you can watch this happen and all of a sudden you realize, wow, I really created a pretty, a pretty serious thing with this because I've got all these people promoting me and telling people how awesome we are and helping this customer who had a bad experience without us having to even step in. It, 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 you're, you're, you're so right. It's, it's funny if somebody, I, I know I think about the different companies that I really, really love. And if somebody has a bad experience, 
I'm almost offended and almost insulted. And I want to start defending that company. If somebody were to say something bad about Nordstrom or, or Southwest Airlines or, or one of these companies that I think has built something really special, I get defensive because I'm such a fan and because I care about them because I feel like they actually care about me too. So you do develop that stuff, but it starts with that culture. It starts with you taking care of people. They're not going to care for you until you care for them. They, they want to know that you care about them and that you do care for them. Definitely. And I have this kind of this idea and this dream that I, I wish the some of the corporate institutions would institute. And it's just get a camera, put it in front of your employees and have them do a one minute with the employee every day. Showcase all the people behind the scenes. You don't need this all this done up million dollar content. You need to showcase the humanity. And that's how you build that following. <clears throat> totally agree with that it is it, it it's sorely missing that so many things have become digital and so many people are hiding behind screens without actually showing up being real and being raw and then there's this obsession around perfection and the, and the truth is we actually don't trust perfection we don't trust the thing that is absolutely without flaws we're looking for flaws because we're all flawed and we want to know that it's real and and it's it's we something and somebody can relate to us if we see the thing that isn't raw we're wondering what did they really leave out? What's what's really true that we're not being told, and that's the missing piece. So totally on the same page. You can't go for perfection and expect people to be connected. Exactly, and that's why I feel companies like you look at Planet Fitness, they focus on the regular person and not being around the meathead or whatever. Uh, some people don't like it, but a lot of people do because it connects with them. It shows, wow, they're they're a gym that doesn't focus on perfection. I can connect with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect example of, of what we should be thinking about. And quite honestly, perfection, even if you can hit that moment in time where it happens, there's such an expectation if people are buying in that you're going to be there that if you are ne- if you're off a little bit, there's this huge letdown. So you're really setting yourself up to be whacked anyway by, with the expectations. So why would you want to be in that space? Perfectly engaging or being all in and obsessed is a lot smarter than trying to perfect something where it's flawless all the time. Agreed. So let's let's shift into something I like to ask everybody that comes on and kind of get, <clears throat> get an idea. And you've got a, a bunch of really good ideas, and our philosophies combine really well. It's what are three things you can you think small businesses or even the regular person who listens to this can do to help them become more customer centric or help them in their lives or better their businesses. Well, one, we, we have to ask the question if, right off. We have to ask the question, what are we doing different? And why does anybody care about us? And, and so really everything starts with the questions. And one of the, one of the ways we can ask better questions is to have other people around us that are willing to ask those when we feel stuck. So for a long time, I've had mentors. I got into a lot of trouble business-wise when I stopped having mentors that were either bald or gray, people that had been out there for a long time. Those people, have they're able to see things in us and beyond what we can see beyond today because the further out we, we can see further out by going back further. And so I like to have people that, that have been around a few decades be, in, in, in addition to my time here, just because they're going to be able to help me see things I can't see in my blind spots. So always having that mentor is, is one of the pa- most powerful things to, to see things that we're missing. And then the other thing is to absolutely not just drink the Kool-Aid of the people that are the thought leaders, but swim in that stuff. It's it's why I study Grant Cardone's books, The 10X Rule and Be Obsessed or Be Average. I, I'm, I'm wearing Grant Cardone's socks right now. I mean, this isn't a, it's a healthy obsession. I'm flying to Miami next week to see this guy and spend three days with him. Why do I do that? Because his stuff is so powerful and it's so intense that I'm not going to just read it. I'm going to embody it. And I think we have to make sure that we're embodying the right thing and not just absorbing what we happen to run into by proximity. The people that are next door to us or in the next cubicle may not be the ones that we want to become like. So we have to figure out who it is we want to become like so that we can express that energy through our brands and through our connection with other people. And it's a conscious choice or it's going to be a default by whoever you happen to be around if you're not willing to make a change. Agreed. I, that's huge. It's what do you want to do? Uh, who's doing it really well? And then how can you connect with them? How can you get in front of them? How can you talk to them? Join a mentoring. What can you do to get their thoughts in your head and consume as much as you can from that person? And that's how you grow. It's You can get stuck in your own little shell doing your own thing and 20 years later not even realize there was another way to do it, which would have helped you create your own philosophy. <clears throat> Yeah, there's, this is reminding me of, um, in, in my book, Reinvented Life, I talk about my transition from building this big business and having it melt down and then reinventing my, myself. And one of the things I learned in that whole experience 
experience that was really, really important. I was becoming the people that I was around. And at the time I was around multimillionaires, people that had lots of Lamborghinis and the big houses. And, and I, I became those people. The problem was I also became who they were underneath what you couldn't see, the invisible, the ethics, the morals, the values, and, or in, in the, this situation, the lack of those things. And so we, we will become those people that are around us. Many people have said this in different ways. It's, it's also true that if we ignore that, if we're not paying attention to it, we're accidentally going to be absorbing things that we're going to look back on with a like, wincing because it's not what we would have chosen if we were conscious. So just asking the question, the people that were around, are they, are they honest? Are they, are they healthy? Are they, are they focused and willing to be obsessed with something? Just these, these simple things, these questions to ask up front, and then being really, really methodical about who we're going to engage with, even just spending time on the phone with. It's, it's going to sound harsh, but a lot of times people say, well, I talk to my, my family, my mom and my dad. I talk to them every day, and I talk to them for an hour, and I, and I, I often go, are they, are they juicing you, or are you, are you addicted to this? Are they really helping you? Because I hear a lot of negativity in you, and I'm guessing that there's a lot of negativity from those conversations. And it's, it, it may be a conversation you might want to back off a little bit of just because it's influencing you so much. So just being conscious to who's influencing you because you're around them can shift everything literally in a heartbeat. Oh, yeah, that's, that's huge. It's, you often find we, we look for mentors, but then we find these people who are, who are selling products just to sell to people's hopes and dreams or selling negativity. Yes. And they just make a living off these products that are, oh, you can get rich tomorrow or you can get rich in two weeks. All you have to do is take this course. There's a guarantee. And then you see at the bottom and there's this earnings disclaimer, like earnings, not typical. Uh, those are the kind of mentors we want to avoid or like you were talking about getting away from the mentors who are either going to tell you you're doing everything amazing because it's family or maybe family who's extremely negative and then you become negative and you are an expression of what you're listening to. <clears throat> That's exactly right. There, there's a, a, a funny movie that I, I actually was in uh, in Whistler a few years back, and I was I ran into the guy that that was the star and the producer, the director of the movie. The movie's called Kumare, and it's by a guy that, that directed it and started it. Vikram Gandhi goes and and he, he decides he's going to dive into this guru space and and he's going to become a guru. His family is is from India, and so he thought, well, I could be a natural guru. So he, he grows his beard out and develops a cult and people follow him because they think that somebody else is going to have the answers and what they didn't realize until the end of the movie when he exposes this whole flaw he says you guys i'm just a regular guy i the guru is inside of you and people are looking for the the pill the red blue pill you know from the matrix they're looking for that pill that'll fix everything and what the truth the truth is we're we're ready to fix us we're ready to do things we're ready to tap into this genius it's in us. It's not somewhere else. And we, and it's, it's really about shifting into the confidence that we have those abilities and then starting to let those things ooze out and boil and, and touch other people. Agreed. I had, I had a mentor a while back who told me, and it, it wraps into this guru idea really well. It, he told me, you know what, if you're confident and you know enough about what you're saying, uh, a lot of people don't even know what they're talking about, but people believe them. It's uh, it's the confidence that it expels everything out of you. And if you know what you're talking about, you understand what you're doing, and you're confident, you're unstoppable. That that that's it. That's there's there's a thing that happens with with investing where people there, there's a common misconception that if we have enough money in the bank and and when we retire, that's a million or two million or five or whatever it is. If there's that much money in the bank, then everything's going to be good and, and we'll be financially secure. And it's a it's a myth. I, I've worked with people over the years, and I, I they come to me and they say, okay, I'm not sure what to do. I've got I've got two million dollars in the bank, and I said, well, what's the problem? And they go, I'm scared that I'm going to lose it because they haven't built the confidence. What they had was an accidental occurrence of saving money, and it happened to have grown in whatever market they happened to have been in. But they don't have the confidence that they could repeat it. The confidence is where the financial security actually lies, because when you lose the money and it happens. You just go, okay, I got it. All right, I can learn from that and I'm going to move on and I'm going to grow it again and I know how to do that. But that's confidence. That's not that's not a pile of money. The confidence changes everything and you can start to develop that by taking action. You cannot develop confidence by sitting still and that's the big key. You're talking about moving forward and growing our businesses. The, the successful people and the successful businesses are on the move. They're not sitting still. You sit still on the, on the train tracks, might be a good view, but eventually you're going to get run over. 100%. It's... The confidence comes into your, you know how to execute, you know how to be consistent, you're listening, now you're confident because you know what's going on, you know what's happening, you're aware of what's going 
uh, people are doing around you. And now you've created this aura where people, they want to listen to you now because what you're saying is what they're asking about and you're confident in what you're saying. So they want to hear what you're saying because you're expelling it really well. And you talked about uh, financials a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what you're, what you're doing right now with people and kind of how you're helping people. The, the thing that, that Total Control Financial, which is the company I founded a year ago, is doing is, is, is helping people develop that muscle. It's the, the confidence muscle with their money. And the first thing we do is we ask the question, do you feel like you're on a roller coaster? Do you feel like you're in jail in, in your Wall Street world? Or if you're not really engaging, but you're thinking about what you do with your money, does Wall Street make you all warm and fuzzy? And usually people go, no, it, it scares the crap out of me. I, I don't have any control and I don't know what's going on. And I feel like I'm being ripped off. And I go, cool. Well, I agree with you. So do you want to do something different? They go, yeah, I want to be in control and in charge. And so what we do is, is we show them and we build their vehicle to where they leave the Wall Street con job. They move into their the space where their money is in their hands, in their checkbook, and they get to use all the cool rules around retirement tax deferral. They get to use all that, that system, but they're not stuck inside the system controlled by Wall Street and the banks and the brokerages and getting feed to death without really knowing what's going on. And ultimately, the entire strategy in that system is just smoking hopium. I mean, people go, I hope it'll all work out. And then they just take a big inhale and then wait 40 years. And, and really, it's not going to work out. So we help people get out of that space, off the roller coaster, unshackle the bondage that they're in, and, and then start empowering them with new ideas and, and a tool to where they can go out and invest and grow their wealth and rearrange their money psychology so that they're, they can develop the confidence, which is really, again, the freedom uh, away from the, the shackles that we've been uh, enslaved with by this, by this system that's really not serving us. It's mo mostly serving itself. Yeah, I love that, trying to get everybody away from this. You, always find, you often find the way the establishment is running is not necessarily good for the people. It's good for the established few who are kind of running it and making the money off the people who are thinking that they're going to be able to get a big return on this at the end of their lives. And then when they don't, um, that's a huge risk. You just you took everything you saved and you, you lost it all or you didn't get back what you thought you were going to get. So. And it's too late. It's by then it's too late. So you don't have, there's no, there's nothing you can do. You have to have the foresight and it doesn't matter whether you're 20 or 50, you've got to have some type of foresight and you've got to believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in yourself yet, you've got to find somebody that you can believe in and trust and start hooking your, your, uh, your, your cart to their, their drive, their, their experience, something, because if you just sit there and idle and hope you're, you're going to have a, a reckoning, that's not going to be very much fun. Definitely. So walk me through, what do you think is the, the biggest misconception in this realm that people kind of think, but isn't necessarily true, and they find this out later? The idea of, of investing for the long term and being patient and waiting and thinking that things are going to compound at 12% a year, like a certain guy on the radio claims that it does, that, that misconception is, is going to crucify most people that have it, you cannot abdicate responsibility for your money and your investing and think that you can just show up three or four decades down the road and everything is going to be fine. That is a myth. It's been propagated by that system. And it's so one of the examples of this that I love to throw out, because as much as I think he's a brilliant genius, the number one investor in the world does not do what he says everybody else should do. The number one investor being Warren Buffett is not a passive investor. He does some passive and so he, he'll buy Coke for and he'll hold it for the next 50 years. This is one of his strategies. But what most people don't realize is that Warren Buffett is heavily active. He's out there selling options on stocks, which means he's active selling, doing things in the markets. He's not just sitting on the sidelines, hanging out on the beach. And we've got to be active as well. Otherwise, we're going to get creamed by the people that are active. So the idea that you can just sit back and have passive income without thinking, yeah, you're going to have a passive experience. You're going to be broke. Exactly. And I think it stems right back into that idea that if you want to do extremely well with something, you want something to have a big turnaround, you can't expect to go live the laptop lifestyle on a beach and just invest, invest once and then check it out every 10 years and hope everything's okay. It's You have to be actively involved and in paying attention if you want that wealth to display itself the way you want it to be displayed. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And it's one of the things that I love to compare it to. It's a relationship. We, we want passive income. We want passive investments. It, if we were to look at our relationship like that, if we were to say, okay, I want a passive relationship, how long do you think it would last for your significant other? How long do you think that they would stay with you if you decided I was gonna, you're going to be 
passive in that relationship, it's going to last a month, maybe, and then they're gone. You can't be passive in something that matters. You've got to be actively engaged or it goes away. That's 100%. It's, if you're not involved, you can't say that it's someone else's fault if you weren't paying attention. And so it's, that, it's like a checks and balances deal. And I think that that's probably one of the reasons that people do kind of check out because there's such a blame victim mentality that has taken over. I mean, everybody's suing everybody and it's this chaotic mess of, of, of victimhood. And what, what I love is seeing people that are responsible. Unfortunately, most people aren't, which is why Wall Street works, because you put your money in there, you do what you're supposed to do according to the system. And then when it crashes, you can blame the system instead of saying, all right, that was me. But people don't want to do that. And so they'll avoid taking responsibility and shifting away from that system because that system gives them a lot of options to blame and never really take responsibility for something that they should be. Exactly. And if you, and it's funny, this does stem back to the relationship really well. If you ask someone about investing or financial advice or anything like that on the social networks, you'll get back, oh, uh, it's just a gamble. There is no, there is no good way to do it. They're all jerks and all you hear a lot of this stuff. So they've created this negative connotation around what they do. That's right. That's it. That's exactly right. I was I was listening to uh, Joshua Milburn and Ryan and Nicodermus uh, on the minimalists, and I think these guys have a lot of brilliance in what they're teaching about stuff and how it can trap us and things. The thing that I really got bummed out about was when these guys were talking about investing and and how they they kept their investment strategy really simple and they just they invested in mutual funds and they thought. The idea around precious metals and alternatives that you could really control was a stupid plan and it was speculation. And I went, wow, these guys have this huge following and they're delivering the typical Wall Street nonsense. And I, I think these guys are good guys. I just think that they don't know any better. And unfortunately, so much of what they've said is really great stuff. And so people are going to listen to the bad with the good and they're going to take that advice instead of thinking for themselves. So it's an interesting thing. We've got to be really careful about who we listen to and make sure that we're, we're vetting their ideas and not just blindly going wherever they, they go because we happen to like them. A hundred percent. I was talking in this entrepreneurship class last night and I was telling them, uh, you may have a guy who has a major following telling people all the wrong information, but they're going to listen to him because he generated that following and he built the relationship with those people. And if you want to be that person that everybody's going to listen to and pays attention to, then you need to generate that following, generate that relationship and become bigger than that person. So your better advice can be heard. That, that's it. And that's what it'll do. It'll, it'll, it'll rise to the occasion. It's, it's also an incredible responsibility when you do have people that are following you. So as you guys build your brands and you have more and more people paying attention and doing things that you suggest or doing things that you do, you've got to be really careful about what you say in terms of what you're doing and not be reckless because people will absolutely follow you. That's just the nature of, of being a fan of something. We tend to do things. Somebody says, hey, I just bought this one thing or I did this one thing. Half the time, I just sign up because I really trust them because I'm a fan, and and so we have to be we have to be conscious. It is a big responsibility, so we shouldn't take it lightly. Exactly, it's it's you have to understand that what you say has major implications across a, a broad range of people. If you have a big following, and you tell these people to do the wrong things, you're essentially ruining lives and creating unhappiness amongst these people. And so it's you have an ethical consideration in this aspect. It's it is what you're saying going to positively impact them in the long run? Or are you just doing this to make money real quick because it's what other people are saying? Yeah, they're, they're, I, that it, it reminds me of the um, of, of what I hear Robert Kiyosaki saying a lot. When he's talking, about, like, people will ask him, and they, people ask me this too. They ask what, what they should invest in, and they want the exact tips on should I do real estate? How do I do real estate? And I, and I'm leery because, and he'll, he'll say the same thing. And I, I think I learned this from him that I have no idea, neither does he, what you should do. What we can do is help you think differently so that you ask better questions and then you figure it out for yourself so you can make a rational decision instead of just going blind and following into the dark, something you don't understand. It's really understand. It's important to understand your context and your psychology first. And that's what we push on people. It's not, hey, you should buy this one thing. It's, hey, you should ask better questions. Let's figure out what those questions might be. And then you find the answers inside you. Exactly. Teach people how to think, teach people how to ask questions and teach people how to be critically involved. And then they can start to sniff out all this, this bad stuff that, um, or this negative stuff that people are saying. And then all of a sudden you can create this thing like, well, I heard this and then I asked this questions and I realized that a lot of people are getting taken advantage from this. And -and so-and-so told me that. And so their advice is incredible. 
Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. But it's it's more of it's the idea that thinking is the hardest work. And so most people won't do it. And if you can help people think, you can help them develop that muscle, then you empower them. And then they're not reliant on somebody else giving them the answers. And that's where you really start to make a difference with people by helping them become stronger in the in and of themselves. That's right. Some people, number one, a lot of people don't have the time to creatively think up these things and to understand these ideas. So if they have a thought leader who can help them, it's going to help them engage a lot more. And then it's going to help you actually create a following and create that positive environment from them doing well and being able to understand the people who maybe not be giving them the best advice. <clears throat> that's it, man. That's exactly right. So looking at uh, kind of tell me what you think a couple of things people can do to make sure they're not making bad decisions uh, that they can kind of at least be aware of. The, the, there's one thing that, that I would absolutely make sure we have, and that is somebody that's either coaching us or mentoring us that we have a lot of respect for. That is, and, and it's a regular thing, not like somebody you visit with once a year that gives you feedback on your disastrous year, but somebody that you're checking in with. And it's the part of that's accountability. And part of that is just ask, being able to ask questions to, to somebody else. I think that we, we miss out on, on having the right people because we tend to stay with people that we're comfortable with. Unfortunately, they tend to be at a very similar level. And one of my best friends and mentor, I has said that it's really important for him to always have somebody that's wiser, more successful, more powerful, older than he is. And it's important for him to have somebody that's that he can also mentor that's younger, that's that has less experience because it keeps him humble and it also allows him to teach. And it's really valuable to, to start teaching something because you learn what you really don't know. And if you it, you can think you know something, the moment you start teaching it and it comes out of your mouth and you go, wow, I really don't have a clue what I'm talking about. So having both of those spaces in our lives, I think there's a beautiful circulation that happens by being in between those two. Oh, that's huge. That's always be learning, be educating, and then you're always going to be evolving. And that's, I think that's how we grow as people. It's how we grow in business. And it's just how we continuously evolve. I totally agree with you, man. So this is a, this has been a great podcast. Uh, I think we have a lot of philosophies and ideas that intermix really well. We, we want to educate people, we want to help people, and we want to make sure they're not going down the road of what people are saying they should do that may or may not be the best ideas for them. I'm with you 100%. I, I, I could not agree with you more. And then wrapping this up, just uh, tell everybody who's listening where they can find more about you. Best place to, to find anything you want to know and anything you don't want to know, but just really anything in the world about Damien Lupo is DamienLupo.com. Visit me there. You, you can see the visit. You can see my books. You can you see the blog. I talk a lot about finance and and my journey and and what I've been through. And it's very candid. It's it's very raw. Sometimes I it, my my book Reinvented Life was actually compared to it was kind of like a, an episode of Breaking Bad. So if that kind of makes you go whoa, that's a, that's pretty intense. That's what you're going to see in my story. And that it's it's a raw experience that I share. And, and I think there's a lot of value there so that you can learn from it and not have to go through the same things. And it gives you a lot of opportunity to figure yourself out wherever you're at, whatever reinvention you're going through. You're going to learn a lot about that, including the money piece, because the money piece can be very empowering or it can just be shackles on us for the rest of our lives. And I do my best to, to deliver value there so that I can help take you out of that bondage and help you become powerful enough to keep yourself out of it. Exactly. I love it. Be real, be human, take care of people, and we all win in the end. Thanks for uh, thanks for jumping on the Chan's Logic podcast. Remember, guys, you can go to DamianLupo.com to get more information about him. And thanks for being a great guest, Damian. Chandler, I appreciate it, man. It's great chatting with you, and I'm, I'm happy to have been here and spent the time with you. Thanks again.